Hi friends, it's your friendly neighborhood Clarity Geek, and today we're talking about documentary film. Now, why are we gonna talk about documentary film? Well, first of all, because they're more popular than they have ever been. As a matter of fact, according to Netflix, last year, 149 million households watched at least one documentary title, and that's on just one streaming platform. That means that millions of us are consuming documentary content, and we're consuming it on a huge number of platforms, from HBO Max and regular cable stations to streaming platforms like Netflix and Hulu. And this has meant big business for these platforms. In 2019, Netflix paid $10 million for one documentary, Knocking Down the House, which traced the path of the squad from their respective cities to the House of Representatives. Now, maybe it's because these streaming platforms know that you might like a documentary based on your viewing history. Maybe it's the algorithms that are successfully suggesting titles that you otherwise wouldn't watch. Or maybe it's because it's like week 386 of the pandemic. Or maybe it's just we're all hungry for content that takes deep and interesting dives into subjects because we're so used to fast food news on social media platforms that documentary is having a real moment right now. But what's really important to understand is that with that moment comes a lot of content that could be an amazingly awesome deep dive or maybe it's junk food and you should skip it. So today, we're gonna talk a little bit about documentaries, their history, and how to tell a really good documentary that you should sit down and watch from something that may not necessarily have your best interest at heart or have poor information and that you should hit skip for. So without further ado, let's talk documentary film. All right, in order to understand documentaries today, we gotta do a little bit of documentary history. And documentary goes all the way back to the very beginning of the film story. As a matter of fact, this right here is the very first film ever copyrighted in the United States. It's super exciting, really compelling to watch. Are you ready? Wait for it. One, two, three. Okay, it's a guy sneezing, but it really happened, right? As a matter of fact, a lot of early films were documentary by default because the goal of early filmmaking was to perfect the technology, the camera. And so they basically pointed the camera at whatever they could find, from people leaving a factory to a train coming into a station. A lot of early films were simply capturing what was around us. And that is a documentary, right? Well, not really. There's a huge difference between a documentary and footage. Most documentary filmmakers say that the goal of a documentary isn't real life, but a true story. And everything you're watching is carefully crafted. So the very first documentary that we would recognize today is Nanook of the North from 1922. It traces an Inuit tribesman and his family as they struggle to survive in very harsh Arctic conditions. And a lot of early documentary was like this. It was taking us to places that we've never been or helping us meet people that we otherwise wouldn't encounter. And you can see this kind of film today in travel documentaries and television series as well as nature documentaries taking us to far off places. Documentary continued to evolve from this genre though into everything from what was essentially dry history lectures that were illustrated with photos to instructional videos that you maybe watched in school to out and out propaganda to the social issue films that are super popular today. This evolution has created a huge variety of documentary films that you can watch from the comfort of your own home. 
and a lot of them are extremely well done. And so we're in this wonderful golden age. But how do you know if you're watching something worth your time or if you're watching something that maybe doesn't have your best interest at heart or maybe is just poorly produced? Well, there's three ways that you can tell if what you're watching is good content. And you know I love me a list, so let's go. Okay, number one, what are you seeing? What are you looking at on screen? It's important because it can give you a lot of information about what you're watching. For example, right now, you can see I'm talking directly to the camera and I'm using a variety of things to illustrate my points. But most of those things are stock footage and it's really just me talking. Whenever you see this, this should light up your kind of skepticism filter. So if somebody is directly addressing a camera and they're saying things and they don't link the sources in the description below, it should raise some healthy skepticism. As a matter of fact, a lot of documentaries, I'm putting those rabbit quotes around that, that I get sent that people say, oh my gosh, this thing's gonna change your life. It's really just some random person droning over either a picture of themselves or for some reason, completely unrelated stock footage. Mountains and meadows seem to be super, super popular in this like genre of YouTube video. The other thing to think about is how did that camera get in that room, okay? I will tell you as a documentary filmmaker, in order to get my camera in a room to watch something happen takes a lot of work. I've got to call people, I've got to get their permission, I have to talk to them before I turn the camera on, I have to get their consent. And so even the most uninvolved cinema verite observational follow doc that is supposed to kind of not be a traditional documentary where someone's giving you facts to a camera has a lot of work behind it. This is especially true when you're seeing these like really intimate moments between two people talking. It's really essential to realize that there's not just two people in that room. You've got those two people plus a camera person, usually a director, and at the very least, a sound person. That means that in order to get that camera in that room, some sort of deal had to be done. That is especially true when you're dealing with celebrities. Celebrities are very conscious about what kind of information gets out about them and how that information is presented. So anytime you've got a celebrity and a camera in a room, there is a contract somewhere. This can be seen in the documentary Hillary, which came out in 2020. Now, Hillary's not a celebrity more, she's a political figure, but she's also a historically reclusive one. So when this documentary came out, film critics were nuts over the access of the filmmakers into the world of Hillary Clinton and her campaign. Well, one of the reasons there was such great footage was because the campaign provided a lot of that footage. And in order to get the documentary made, Hillary's people and Hulu, who produced the documentary, had a, lot of, uh, had a lot of agreements to the point where Hillary's people even helped choose the director. The Columbia Journalism Review says that this is a really big uh, trend, especially in streaming platform documentaries about celebrities. So it's really important to pay attention to, huh, I wonder how much influence this celebrity is having over what's being shown. I wonder where they got that footage. How did they get that camera there? These are all really, really good questions to ask whenever you watch a documentary. Because a documentary is very different from traditional journalism. Traditional journalism is facts that are set into a story. A documentary is a story set off with facts. And while documentaries can be great ways to get interested in a topic or to get a good introduction into a topic, it should never be your only source. All right, that being said, let's look at number two right now. Let's go. Number two, who are they talking to? 
What experts are they using? A lot of documentaries absolutely rely on expert testimony. They want people to give context to the other images that are being seen. But it's really important to pay attention to who those experts are and what they're saying. If they're quoting data, and that data is on the screen and then off the screen, it's a really good idea to rewind and to take a second to look at that data. For example, in one documentary that denies the official explanation of 9-11, there's this FEMA report and it's popped on the screen and then immediately taken right back off. If you go to that FEMA report, it's like 70 pages long and there is a ton of information. This documentary takes one or two sentences out of the whole report. That kind of manipulation is really easy to see through. In another documentary, Netflix's The Social Dilemma, we see this effort to caution the viewers about social media algorithms and this kind of drive for engagement and social media addiction. It's kind of an odd diatribe for a company that primarily utilizes those same algorithms to get us to watch hours and hours of reruns of Criminal Minds, but you know, here we are. And they paint this very dangerous picture of social media as this manipulator. And they have a lot of talking heads, but they're almost all technologists, ethicists, and people who are willing to tell us that social media is ruining our lives. They then pair that with this like weird reenactment or dramatization of the inside of a teenager's head as he tries to fight social media addiction that really looks like a Malcolm in the Middle and the Matrix had a baby. And it's kind of just this long diatribe about how social media is killing us. And while I certainly understand the point of view, it seems to be missing some key points of view. Because while we're talking to social media technologists and ethicists, what's missing are the viewpoints of psychologists and sociologists and people who are thinkers in the field who take a more moderate view about social media. And one more quick piece before we move on to the next point, beware of dramatic reenactments. If you have most of your documentary being a reenactment, it should raise some of your hackles because it means that there is a need to create some sort of something for you to watch. Another Netflix documentary series called Spycraft is probably about 80% comprised of dudes in hats walking seriously down hallways carrying briefcases. And that gives me a lot of pause because it just means that there wasn't that many images to show. And that means that we have to rely solely on the testimony of experts. So always pay attention to who's talking, who's not talking, and what kind of evidence those talking heads can show. Now, for our last point, let's go behind the camera. Last up, pay attention to who's behind the camera. A lot of times the people who are directing a documentary are not participants. There's a special subgenre of documentary called participatory, and that's where you get your Michael Moores and your David Attenboroughs, who you can quickly see are the ones who are really telling the story. Most documentaries aren't going to be that upfront about who is behind the camera because that's not the reason for their story to be told. This is especially true in observational or behavioral documentaries where the goal is for the camera to disappear as much as possible. So it's worth your time to quickly Google who is behind these films. One thing that I've noticed on YouTube is that the site RT gets a lot of traffic and they produce news and documentary content that is viewed millions of times. If you quickly Google RT, you will find that this is Russian Times and they are state-funded media. That's nowhere on their YouTube About page and it's something that I think people should be aware of when they're watching documentary content because it's definitely going to influence that content. It's really important to pay attention to who is paying for these documentaries. It's really good to look at what kind of grants they get. Most documentary film isn't going to make back in box office sales what it costs to put the documentary together in the first place. 
This is super common, especially because documentaries are becoming more and more expensive because streamers like Netflix and Hulu are raising the bar for documentary quality. That means that external funders are often footing the bill. A really good documentary will clearly list at their, in their credits or on their website where that funding comes from and who those organizations are. White Noise, a, a film put together by The Atlantic, is very clear about its funding sources and the fact that it is an Atlantic publication. You can not only view the bios of every single person involved, but you can link to the reporting of a lot of those professionals to see where they're coming from. The Frontline Show, which is one of the longest running documentaries on uh, documentary series on PBS, is very, very clear that they're a PBS show, they get their funding from a variety of sources, and they provide the sources and the filmmakers, usually in their description or during the film itself. This is documentary filmmaking that you can really rely on in terms of ethical quality and journalistic integrity. And even though a lot of times there's still an editorial, editorial quality to these films, at the very least, they're providing full disclosure. Now, full disclosure for me, my name is Lisa Pavia Hegel. I'm an assistant professor of communications at Jefferson College. And what you've been watching is a Clarity Geeks production. You can see more of our content on theclaritygeeks.com and on this YouTube channel. And I'll see you later. Bye.